Despite her pivotal role in South Africa's anti-apartheid struggle, information about Lillian Ngoyi's life is limited. The few paragraphs on her legacy repeat a few tired phrases. South Africa's a mother of the black resistance, a widow and rumored lover of Nelson Mandela, and the first woman member of the African National Congress TA National, S Executive Committee, the core leadership of the resistance movement that would later become the government of a democratic South Africa. She was also a key figure in the country's well-known Women's March. On August 9, 1956, now known as Women's Day in South Africa, Goyi and other female leaders led an estimated 20,000 women to the union buildings in Pretoria, the seat of power of the white minority government. They were opposing the extension of the despised pass laws to women. These laws required black citizens to carry pass documents in order to better control their movement. Aside from that, Mondoyi, as she was affectionately known, remains a well-known but somewhat two-dimensional historical figure. Perhaps because she was not the wife of a prominent ANC leader and spent much of her life as a prohibited person, dying in poverty, there is no Lillian Goy foundation or substantive biography. Nonetheless, her pioneering role and sacrifices extended far beyond the Women's March. Ngoi, who was born Lillian Mercedeba Motebane in 1911, led a different life than other anti-apartheid struggle figures. Not only was she an independent woman, but she was born into urban poverty. She did not hail from a royal or rural household like the Mandelas, Sisulus, and other elite members of the ANC, whose role in the fight against apartheid is well documented. Goy was the granddaughter of a trailblazing Methodist minister, a historical figure in his own right. But his extraordinary contribution to the missionaries' endeavors in Southern Africa did not translate into any significant upward mobility for the family. Her mother was a literate washerwoman and domestic worker, while her father was a miner and laborer who died of mining-related lung disease. She was the last in line for education because she was the only girl in a family of our. Despite this, Ngoi's family rallied to keep her at Kilnerton, a leading black Methodist school, even though she could only complete her junior year, she relocated to Johannesburg to work as one of the country's first black female trainee nurses at City Deep Mine Hospital. Her youth typified the contemporary experience of many black women in urban South Africa. She fell pregnant at 19, married at 23, but was widowed at 26. She took on the care of her newborn cousin when her brother's wife died and was the primary carer for her elderly parents. The family spent a miserable decade living in the shelters, the site of the country's first urban land invasion under the charismatic James Banzer, who encouraged backyarders to occupy open land in Orlando, Soweto. Here, Ndo experienced the indignity of poverty firsthand. Politics changed everything for her. In 1953, at the tail end of the defiance campaign, a mass non-violent resistance protest, Ngoi risked a three-year prison sentence by walking into the whites-only section of a Johannesburg post office. Apartheid laws created and policed racially segregated spaces and to defy them took great bravery. Ngoi became an ANC member and rose rapidly through its ranks. She joined the newly formed Federation of South African Women, FETSO, forging a lifelong friendship with trade unionist and activist Helen Joseph. A broad-based coalition of women's organizations, FEDSO was the organizer of the Ngoi had the skill to inspire mass mobilization and bring people together, especially women. By all accounts, she was an exceptional orator. 1956 March, with Ngoi and Joseph leading the way. In 1955, Ngoi was sponsored for an overseas trip by the Women's International Democratic Federation, regarded as a Soviet front organization. She attended conferences and propaganda tours in Europe, China, and the USSR. She returned home to the government's plans to extend the pass system to women. The experience abroad of being treated like a human being for the first time had invigorated her. Ngoi set about canvassing support for the famous march. 
the largest gathering of women in the country's history. It was the kind of mid-1956 Ngoi was among 156 dissidents arrested in a swoop by security police. Charged with treason, they became known as the treason trialists. She was finally acquitted in 1960, but had lost her job as a factory machinist. She was soon arrested again and detained for five months, 19 days off which she spent in solitary confinement. In a 1963 arrest, she spent 71 days in solitary, an experience which affected her ability to focus. Thereafter, Ngoi drops out of history. She was subjected to three five-year banning orders, living in a state of permanent lockdown. For most of the remainder of her life she was forbidden from interacting with other banned persons. She was unable to meet with more than three people at a time and could not attend a lecture, go to the cinema or accept invitations to weddings, funerals or parties of any sort. The banning orders ended her political career and gradually eroded her ability to earn a living as a seamstress, unable to travel into town to purchase fabrics a security police frequently raided her home, chasing away potential customers Ngoi was forced to rely on sporadic donations. She was not the wife of an elite ANC leader, and she received no financial support from exiled men, nor was she supported by the International Defense and Aid Fund, which assisted political prisoners' families. She did not give up hope, however, and, like Mandela, found solace in gardening, planting seeds sent to her by friends in other countries. Her small yard was overflowing with flowers. Ngoi died on March 13, 1980, two months before her third banning order was set to expire. She was 69 years old. She never saw freedom in her lifetime, and she was never recognized for her efforts to achieve it. At her funeral, activist and church leader Desmond Tutu said that when the true history of South Africa was written Goy's name would be in letters of gold. To some extent, this has manifested itself, a few clinics and roads bear her name. However, the true nature of her achievements and challenges, as well as those of other banned and banished South Africans, should never be forgotten.